Hi folks, this is Jason, hope you're okay today. I just thought I'd do another video before I go to sleep on uh, pre and uh, we'll just hear him speak. And uh, he developed the presuppositional apologetic, so we'll just hear him speak. And uh, this is a uh, Van Til, excuse me, talking about um, Immanuel Kant. So that's um, Cornelius Van Til who developed this apologetic that, that I'm going to give you. Um, okay. 
like I said, you can get a summary of this, what I'm about to share with you, um, from uh, Greg Banson's book, Always Ready. Um, and um, the article of his book is edited by Steve R. Scrivener. And the first thing that I want to say is that there are two competing systems of thought, the believer and the unbeliever's system. Uh, this is vital in understanding presuppositional apologetics, and we find it in Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, verse 3 and 8. We read, In whom I hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, and this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of deceit after the tradition rudiments of the world and not after Christ so there's the, there's the world system and there's man system there's the believers system of thought and the non-believers system of thought what that means is even the laws of thought method uh, evidence are all all evaluated in light of our presuppositions, Luke 16.31. He <coughs> 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 said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. <coughs> All our arguments, all the thinking that we have, come back to the basic presuppositions that we have. Um, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. One Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1:20. <coughs> we read. Where is the wise, the scribe, where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made the foolish the wisdom of the world? You see, the world's wisdom is foolishness. Now, what we need to realize is the nature of human beings is that they are made in the image of God. They are, at the very heart, religious. We can read that in Genesis 1.26. Genesis 1, uh, 26. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. And This is Steve R. Scrivener's that he researched in Greg Banson's book. Okay. So, human beings are made in the image of God, and they know that God exists. Romans 1.19 Romans 1.19 Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. Verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So, human beings know that there is a God. But human beings change the truth for a lie. 
Romans 1.25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the Creator more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. And because of this, he becomes foolish and shows no respect for God. Proverbs 1.7 Proverbs 1 7 the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge but fools despise wisdom and instruction so human beings know there's a God they reject God for a lie and then they show a lack of respect reverence for God and become foolish and therefore he will not want to stand on what God's Word says Matthew 7 26 Matthew 7 26 Matthew 7 26 Matthew 7 26 27 and everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be like unto a foolish man which build his house on the sand And so human beings suppress the truth of God and the revelation of God's nature. Romans 1.18 For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And therefore when he does this he chooses or she chooses to follow the cre creature rather than the creator Romans 1 25 who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever Amen so what we see here in this apologetic is basically when you're debating and discussing the Christian faith with people they generally have their system of thinking and it's opposed to your system as a Christian they are biased they're not coming it object coming at it objectively they will see it their way but also they are suppressing the truth and they know what the truth is that's what the scriptures are saying. In my own experience of discussing and debating with atheists and many people on the streets, I, I've, I've seen this with my own eyes. Most people know there is a God. And so the unbeliever then begins to flaunt the word of God and mock it. Proverbs 13, 16. Proverbs 13 16 every prudent man dealeth with the knowledge but a fool layeth open his folly and because of this pride and rejection of God exchanging it for a lie the unbelievers mind becomes futile and darkened Ephesians 4 17 Ephesians 4.17 This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind having the understanding darkened being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart the blindness of their heart in fact the unbeliever hates the knowledge of God Proverbs 122 Proverbs 122 but 
how long will you simple ones you love simplicity will you love simplicity the scorners delight in the scorning of fools hate knowledge The unbeliever is is without excuse. He is without an apologetic, for he knows in Romans one twenty what the truth is. It's not about factual information. It's about rebellion, not wanting to stand on the authoritative word of God. That's basic the apology situation when we're coming to deal with non-Christian. Secondly, the requirements of the apologist, says Reverend Scrivener, uh, Steve R. Scrivener, um, who's edited the book by Greg Banson. An apologist must not be quarrelsome or arrogant. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Two Timothy chapter two twenty three. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do engender strife, and the sermon of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach and patient. We should teach with humility, James. Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness and wisdom. And he must be peaceable in his argumentation. 1 Peter 3 1. 1 Peter 3 1. Uh, 1 Peter 15, sorry. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. An apologist must use the word of God as the starting point for his apologetic, Matthew 7.29. Matthew 7.29. And the rain descended and the winds flood and the winds blew and beat upon the house and fell and great was the fall of it. That's because they didn't listen to the word of God. And the apologist must think God's thoughts. Psalm 36, 9. Psalm 36, 9. For with thee is the fountain of life and in thy light shall we see light. We shouldn't attempt to be neutral, but we should view God's word as more sure than even his personal experience of the facts, 2 Peter 1.16. But we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of the majesty. For he received from God the Father honour and glory, and there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The Christian apologist must begin to deal with the opponent or the unbeliever's presuppositions in Romans 1.18 and make sure that he knows his own presuppositions and understands them well. Colossians chapter 2 verse 3. Colossians 
Colossians 2 verse 3. In whom I hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, and this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. The apologist must bring every idea and thought to captive to the word of God. 2 Corinthians 10.4 2 Corinthians 10 4 For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds casting down imaginations every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ The apologist must seek to get the unbeliever to surrender his or her presuppositions to the presuppositions of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 5. Casting down imagination and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bring it into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So that's basically... Um, two things we've looked at the nature of the apologetic situation the requirements of the apologist and I just want to interject here I, I do think that a lot of Christian apologists are doing their apologetics it's not based on the Bible and I think that the strength of the presuppositional approach is they are trying to base it and root it in the Word of God and I think that is absolutely wonderful What is the prophetic, um, the apologetic task? Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of the world? Have not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? The apologetic task is to show that the opponent's view is foolishness compared to God's wisdom. We need to turn to Proverbs 26 verse 4. And we read these words. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest also you be like unto him. Answer a fool according to his folly lest he be wise in his own conceit. So we're to show the foolishness of the unbeliever's position and answer him according to his own foolishness. Proverbs 26, 4 and 5 Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. Knowing that the opponent or the unbeliever is trying to suppress the truth, what we have to do is educate the unbeliever as to the true methodology and the true way of looking at things. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 23. Two Timothy chapter 2 verse 23. 3 and 25 but foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do not gender strife that they do that knowing that they gen, do gender strife and the sir So therefore we must educate the unbeliever in a few basic information. Number one, that God is the so sovereign determiner of possibility and impossibility. Acts 26 verse 8.
Acts 26 verse 8. Why should it be thought that the thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? The facts means that we should also look at the Lordship of Christ, that every fact, everything should be submitted to his Lordship. Acts 26. Death, I gave my voice against them, and I published them. I published them often in every synagogue and compel, compelled them to blaspheme and being exceedingly mad against them. I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Wherein I, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And Paul talks about how he submitted to Christ. In verse 27, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Paul had submitted his mind to Christ and saw others to submit to Christ. And so, in Acts chapter 26, 1920, we see that the unbeliever has to have a Copernican revolution of his mind or her mind concerning her presuppositions. Scriptural authority is what helps us to understand history and interpret it, Acts 26, 22, 23. The unbeliever's presupposition should be forcibly attacked, asking questions of knowledge, whether knowledge is possible uh, given those presuppositions. We do this to show that the wisdom of the world is foolishness, 1 Corinthians 1.20. The believer could put himself in the unbeliever's position and then show the folly of the unbeliever's position. The unbeliever's claim should be reduced to stupidity by an internal critique of the system. The apologist should appeal to the unbelievers' uh, image of God within them in Genesis 1.26. The clear inescapable revelation, the inexcus the um, eradicable knowledge of God in Romans 1.18.21. This knowledge can be shown by showing the unwitting expressions, quote, or by pointing to the borrowed capital, unadmitted presuppositions which can be found in the unbeliever's position. The apology should declare the self evidence and authoritative truth of God, John 5.37. John 5 and 37. And the Father himself, which hath sent him, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his at any time, nor seen his shape. John 5, 37 and 39. And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. And ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent him, ye believe not. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. The word of God has to be central, and it's only the word of God that gives the precondition of intelligibility, Colossians 2.3. Colossians 2, 3. In whom I hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge.
The apologist can explain the unbeliever's state of mind hostility in Colossians 1.21. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, you now have been reconciled. And now hath he reconciled. And then we finally show that only scripture can help us to escape the futility and the damnation. Let's turn to Ephesians 4.17. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not of the Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. So we've come to the end of this article. Uh, an edited version of Greg Banson's Always Be Ready uh, by Steve R. Scrivener. Very, very helpful article indeed. Very helpful. And um, my own conclusion is that is a radical apologetic. I think there's so much good in that apologetic, and I think it's uh, really helpful. Uh, I use the presuppositional and the minimal effect approach together, but uh, we've looked at Van Til and his methodology a little bit tonight, and I hope that it's been an encouragement and a help to you and challenge you to be try and be biblical in your approach. Um, Here's a little bit more of Van Til. Um, This is uh, Van Til on Scripture. Our message this morning is on Christ and the Scriptures, based on John 5, verses 37 to 40, and John 10, verses 34 to 36. On the basis of this passage of the Gospel of John, we deal with the necessity, the authority, the clarity, and the sufficiency of Scripture. But that Jesus came into the world to save his people from their sins. The Father hath sent him into the world for this very purpose. Jesus said, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do, for what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son. Likewise, just come along to Jerusalem to see a striking example of this work. Right past the sheep market we go. See those impotent folks, the blind, the halt, the wither. See how they crowd one another for a place near that pool. And see that poor man there. For 38 years he has been helpless. See the desperation on his face. He has tried ever so often but he can never get into the pool quickly enough after the troubling of the waters. But here comes Rabbi Jesus, pray for him. Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. The man obeyed. How could he help but do so? He now has life flowing through his limbs, but it was on the Sabbath day. And here comes another rabbi. <coughs> his name is Jonathan. Rabbi Jonathan knows his prophet. He quotes Jeremiah 17. Thus says the Lord, take heed to yourselves and bear no burden on the Sabbath day. Now the mob gathers. How dare you set yourself against the commandment of God? Who are you that dares to speak against God? Only those who are moved by Satan do this. How dare you tell this man to bear a burden on the Sabbath day? 
said Jesus, in effect, in healing this man, I did the work which my father sent me, his son, to do. And in carrying his bed on the Sabbath day, he is not breaking the commandments of God. On the contrary, he is showing forth the fact that the Sabbath is made for man, and not man made for the Sabbath. I came not to destroy, but to fulfill the law. But who then are you, Jesus? Are you greater than Moses? Comes the simple response, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into death, but is passed from death unto life. They look at one another in amazement. So he means to say that we are spiritually impotent, as that old cripple there was physically impotent, and he means to say that he alone can work the work of the Father in making men alive. He says that he has come to us to give us everlasting life. He has come to save us from condemnation. And if we don't listen, then he tells us that the Father has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. So he thinks he is the promised Messiah. So he makes himself equal with God. But surely we must cling to Moses and the prophets. When Moses said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. A man who makes himself out to be God must be put away. He blasphemes. Satan laughs at this conversation. Jesus has come to claim to destroy him and his kingdom. He had tried in vain to deflect the course of Jesus' work by tempting him to take the kingdom from him, that is, from Satan. That's Van Til on uh, Christ's uh, scripture. And, uh, let's get a little bit more. If the angel of the evening's class, if I were to guess as to why you have come to Westminster Seminary, my first guess would be that you did not go to Expo 67. You were just too busy gathering funds for coming to Westminster. Perhaps last year, some one of those days, you came to the campus and visited the dining room, you were invited to lunch. And you heard the students argue about Arminianism, Calvinism, Amaralianism, Superlapsarianism, Infralapsarianism, and many other such names. And you thought that must be wonderful. And you thought you wanted to join in. And then maybe you visited one of the classes, and you heard one of the professors in great earnestness say that it was really a matter of life and death, that we, we should preach the gospel of Christ who died on the cross and rose again on a certain point in history, and that not everybody seems to believe this today. So you made up your mind then and there that you would enroll in the seminary, and you got a blank from Mr. Slope, and he registered your name. And then some little time later, when you were out in Chicago, you met Dr. McClellan, Joseph C. McClellan, one of the writers in the Christian Century, that great ecumenical magazine. In the course of coffee, as you were treating him, he said to you, well, where are you going to seminary? And you said to him, Westminster. He kept silent for a moment, and then he said, have you been to Expo 67? <laughs> and you have to admit that as yet you had not. He said, I wish you could go, because if you go, you will see there the Christian pavilion. I am sure you will go to, will go to see that. 
And then you will see something different, and perhaps you will reconsider your choice of seminary. So in this division, there are, he says, three zones. The first zone gives you the ordinary affairs of life and its finality and its grandeur. That's a neutral zone. But then by a carpeted stairway, you go down to the second zone. And there you see loneliness, alienation, hatred, segregation, starvation, desperation. And then at the end of that second zone, there is a little room, and in that little room, there is a play, now being played, it is, the name of it is The Eighth Day. This film documents man's cruel stupidity and inhumanity. Talk about Calvin speaking of total depravity. He doesn't know anything about such things. It's the death psychology. It's pride. Someone said it. We read a few pages that pride is enough to shock any decent being. Well, <laughs> it's here that you see what pride tells you and what death psychology and existentialism tell you about the real death of degradation of man's inhumanity to man. But then Charles Jagman, the pavilion designer, has something else in mind too. The message of hope, which the idea of an eighth day of the week for Jews and Christians has always symbolized. And then when you have seen this movie, you, can, you will pass on to the third zone, and there you will see Jesus picture, symbolizing five moments in Christian experience, birth, life, death, resurrection, and life in the spirit, which is Pentecost for all. These pictures teach us of life, human life, in all of its forms, familiar and grotesque, noble and base, kind and cruel, yet is open to the divine presence and power. Walking out of this pavilion, you say to yourself, I wonder if Mr. McClellan, McClellan doesn't have a point. Isn't it perhaps true that we traditional people, those of us in the denomination, whether Presbyterian, Baptist, or Reformed, Episcopal, or whatever else, that we have been in our tradition of folks pretty stultifying, that we have thought of doctrines and more doctrines and truths about a God of whom, after all, who can know. Is that what Jesus wanted to do? He didn't have any doctrines to teach. He wanted to give us life and give it life abundantly. So then if the gospel means reconciliation, as it surely means, the harmony which is God's will for his creation, then the attempt to erect a structure such as this pavilion offers is certainly true to the gospel. It can well serve as a model for a point of contact with people who do not know the gospel. So walking to your car, you decide to withdraw your application to Westminster Seminary, and to enroll instead at Princeton Theological Seminary. For you know that Princeton is one of those great institutions of learning, which stands for modern ecumenism, and that it is one is owned and operated under the direction of one of the eight churches that have created this civility. And so then, what better to do in advance